geopolitical competition is heating up in the Indo-Pacific region. Và thế kỷ 21 là cái thế kỷ của khu vực Ấn Độ Dương Thái Bình Dương mà cái lưu lượng thương mại của thế giới đi qua đây là chiếm đến khoảng 70% và do đó nó chiếm khoảng 2/3 GDP của thế giới và chính vì vậy mà cái khu vực này rất quan trọng. Southeast Asia has really been critical for Japan and Japan to this day is still the biggest investor in the region even though China is rapidly catching up. In Vietnam, Japanese investment is transforming the fourth largest city of Da Nang. Thì trong đó thì các nhà đầu tư Nhật Bản chiếm cái tỷ trọng cũng rất là lớn với 52 dự án và hơn 700 triệu đô. In Jakarta a major infrastructure project is underway, promising to alleviate a long-standing problem in the city, traffic jams. So far, overall progress is about 43% completed. And with the station here, Mona Station, we already completed construction of the diaphragm wall. Japan has also unveiled an ambitious plan to accelerate an energy transition in Southeast Asia. Thì dự kiến là cái phát triển về điện năng của Việt Nam hiện nay thì trung bình là khoảng 10% một năm. In an era of great power rivalry, how will Japan's strategy in the Indo-Pacific region impact geopolitics in Southeast Asia? A network of railways, roads, ports, factories, and power stations has been built across Southeast Asia. They're the outcome of foreign investments intended to enhance economic connectivity and cooperation. The strategy sounds familiar, but this isn't China's Belt and Road Initiative. Instead, they're part of Japan's vision of creating a free and open Indo-Pacific. The late ex-Prime Minister Shinzo Abe proposed the plan in 2007. It was only years later, during his second term, that he managed to kick the plan into gear. But he was really focusing on this connection of the economies of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, uh, to bring new prosperity to the region. But in order to do that, they needed to have partners. So in a sense, the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, concept really predated the Belt Road Initiative. The region's importance has intensified after the Trump and then Biden administrations adapted Japan's plans and tailored them to their geopolitical strategy. And because of this, some have called the Indo-Pacific strategy Shinzo Abe's greatest legacy. Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP, focuses on the confluence of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It promotes economic development and enhanced connectivity between Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Southeast Asia is critical to the overall plan. I would say that the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy runs on two tracks. One is economic connectivity, and the other one is rule of law to structure relations among the regional actors. On the economic side, for example, you have now Japan being an architect of mega trade agreements, making a push with infrastructure finance. And on the security front, you see reforms to deepen the alliance with the United States and an all-out diplomatic engagement with Southeast Asia in an attempt to stabilize relations with uh, China and also to diversify security partnerships with the UK, Australia and India now receiving a much larger degree of attention from Japan.
A major example of a FOIP infrastructure project is taking place in Indonesia, the fourth most populous country in the world. Jakarta, the nation's capital, is one of the most congested places on the planet. In 2006, the Indonesian government signed a deal with Japan to develop the country's first mass rapid transportation system in Jakarta. The first phase was completed in 2019. Currently, we are actually in the midst of constructions. The second phase is part of the North-South Line. And so this phase is another 12 kilometers. The $2 billion second phase is funded by a loan from the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA. For the constructions of MRT, we were using the overseas loan from Japan with a special terms that requires us to uh, utilize or procure uh, a minimum 30% components from uh, Japan. In our case, it comes in the forms of Japanese technology, especially in the railway systems, such as the rolling stocks, the telecommunication system, the signaling systems, and also the power systems. Meanwhile, the 70% of it consists of Indonesian components or others in the forms of our raw materials, our resources, human resources, such as the workers, the site supervisors, the subcontractors, etc. A giant Japanese tunnel boring machine churns through the rocks of Jakarta's underground. Trains will run through these tunnels when they are complete, transporting tens of thousands of commuters a day, alleviating Jakarta's traffic problem. The tunneling work is led by Shimizu Corporation. There are several issues or challenge. One of the example is uh, one station is constructed in the middle of the street with heavy traffic. We occupy only limited area to allow the uh, traffic. The work must have as little impact as possible on the already congested roads of Jakarta and the problems extend below ground. Kemudian hal lain, proyek ini juga uh, seperti ketahui di pusat kota juga terdapat banyak utilitas di bawah tanah. Perlu upaya untuk bisa kami relokasi terlebih dahulu karena akan terdampak untuk kebutuhan konstruksi kami di lapangan. The engineers are currently tunneling along the edge of the grounds of the National Monument. The station here will be one of the most important in the city. It will be within walking distance of the National Museum, the National Library, and the Presidential Palace. Here we the construction site for Mona Station. The length of the station is about 280 meters. The depth is roughly 20 meters from the ground level. Phase two of the MRT's North-South Line is expected to be completed in December 2024. I would say that one of the challenge in Jakarta is actually how to make people use more public transportations. And the key for that is that the public transportation in Jakarta has to be well integrated. Kalau naik MRT itu enak aja sih kayak jadi nggak perlu ikut macet sama yang di jalan raya juga kan terus dari stasiun KRL yang buka stasiun MRT-nya dekat itu The Jakarta MRT has already become an important feature in many of Jakarta's daily commutes. Japan is not the only country investing in public transportation. In 2015, despite Japan being the front runner on the Jakarta Bandung high speed rail, the project was ultimately awarded to China. So when Indonesia decided that, yes, we're going to take from China, for China, it's very surprised. At that time, China offered a cheaper proposal than Japan. It also offered 40% Chinese ownership and 60% Indonesian ownership, whereas in Japan, it's not allowed. It's more sort of like business to business without that kind of like similar joint venture. And the Chinese agreed 
that they don't need government guarantee on financing, whereas Japan still wants the Indonesian government to provide financial guarantee. Um, and the, the second aspect, uh, aside to the financial aspect, is the technical aspect. The Chinese investors, they have agreed to provide technology transfer, whereas from Japan's proposal, there's no clear technology transfer or any training possibilities. Despite Japan's lost deal, it continues to make other big investments. One of them in a very important area. In November 2022, the United States, Japan and other countries announced the Just Energy Transition Partnership to help Indonesia in keeping within the 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming limit. An estimated $20 billion of public and private financing will be mobilized over a three to five year period. As we accelerate our investment in speed transition to the future, to meet the climate crisis head on, we have to make sure that they benefit people everywhere, everywhere, not just in the larger country. And that's why we're proud to partner with Indonesia and Japan under both our colleagues, uh, the non-flagging leadership of both of them, together with a broad coalition of countries to create the Just Energy Transition Partnership. I think on the surface, it is a very important initiative to be supported. It will help Indonesia a long way to push for energy transition and also secure uh, green development in Indonesia. But I think so far the concern is how to integrate this initiative into Indonesia's overall uh, restructurization and also reform in the energy sector. In 2021, Japan announced a separate scheme, the Asian Energy Transition Initiative, pledging 10 billion US dollars to help ASEAN nations lower carbon emissions. The initiative hopes to spur investments in clean energy. Countries in the region have agreed collectively to generate at least 23% of their energy needs from renewable sources by 2025. Another area of focus for Japanese investments, supply chain resilience. Japanese investments are enabling a 400-year-old stone carving tradition to remain a relevant and viable business. And amidst growing competition between the US and China for semiconductors, Japanese investment is transforming a Vietnamese city into an emerging electronics powerhouse. Japan has a strategy known as the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP. As part of this, it plans to invest in an economic bloc with two main trade routes in Indochina. The East-West Corridor aims to build a large economic bloc along a 1,700-kilometer land route from Vietnam to Myanmar via Laos and Thailand. From there, access can be gained to India over the Bay of Bengal. The Southern Economic Corridor enhances trade development from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam through Cambodia and also links to Myanmar. Da Nang, Vietnam's fourth largest city, is a major stop on the East-West Economic Corridor. This city has consistently topped Vietnam's Information and Communications Technology Index rankings. And now it wants to turn itself into an ASEAN Silicon Valley. And Japan has been the leading investor in helping to turn that vision into reality. Khu công nghệ cao Đà Nẵng được thành lập vào năm 2010 với diện tích 1129 hecta với đầy đủ các cái phân khu chức năng. Hiện tại thì khu công nghệ cao Đà Nẵng đã thu hút được cả 26 dự án với vốn đầu tư gần 1 tỷ đô la. À, trong đó có nhiều nhà đầu tư đến từ Nhật Bản, Hàn Quốc, Hoa Kỳ. This park is one of several industrial zones scattered throughout Đà Nẵng city. 
The park is newly built, so 70% of it is still available for lease. And authorities are already planning an expansion phase. It's the availability of space in Da Nang that's helped attract Japanese companies, especially those with plans to scale up. Hiện tại chúng tôi có 515 dự án, trong đó có 383 cái dự án à, trong nước với cái vốn đầu tư cam kết gần 30 000 tỷ và 131 dự án FDI à, với cái vốn là đầu tư cam kết gần 2 tỷ đô la. À, thì trong đó thì à, các nhà đầu tư Nhật Bản chiếm cái tỷ trọng cũng rất là lớn à, với 52 dự án và hơn 700 triệu đô. Japanese manufacturer Murata has two factories in Vietnam. The one in Da Nang is the company's largest. They make ceramic-based passive electronic components, essential in the manufacturing of communications devices and power supply modules for electronic products. The latest smartphone is equipped with around 1,000 multi-layer ceramic capacitors and a single EV uses roughly 10,000 of them. Murata produces 40% of the global supply of these components. Thì ở Đà Nẵng thì có điều kiện về cơ sở hạ tầng bao gồm là có cảng biển và cảng hàng không thì nó rất là thuận lợi cho cái việc là xuất nhập khẩu. Đồng thời Đà Nẵng cũng là một cái thành phố trung tâm và lớn nhất ở khu vực trung tâm của đất nước Việt Nam. Thì ở đây thì chúng tôi có thể là có cái lực lượng lao động đảm bảo cho việc là sản xuất. In 2021, global semiconductor sales reached 595 billion US dollars, a 26% increase from the previous year. China made up the largest share of those sales. This increasing demand for tech components comes at the height of the economic rivalry between the US and China. To meet rising global demand, Murata is spending about $30 million on a new building at its Da Nang facility. So even before the outbreak of the pandemic, Japan had actually been trying to push for um, Japanese companies to uh, divest from, uh, from China and either not necessarily relocate back to Japan, but relocate to elsewhere across Southeast Asia. Thailand and Vietnam were, it seems particularly attractive. Um, with the onset of COVID, Tokyo was one of the first governments to actually incentivize companies to, to actually provide some kind of financing to ensure that they were able to get out of, of China and re reoperate um, either back in Japan or elsewhere in Southeast Asia. And I think it sent a signal that in some areas where we could see greater uh, tension between the United States and China and the imposition of export controls that could make it harder for some companies to continue to operate or supply China, that maybe that's a way in which you could facilitate adjustment and diversification. When it comes to advanced manufacturing and sectors that uh, revolve around these new cutting edge technologies, AI, supercomputing, industries like that, it's going to be a very different environment and we're already beginning to see uh, decoupling uh, happening. Vietnam has been the top gainer from the recent influx of companies relocating or expanding production outside of China. Mong muốn rằng là Việt Nam có thể tham gia sâu rộng hơn trong cái quá trình thương mại hóa toàn cầu và thành phố cũng đã có những cái kế hoạch xây dựng. Chúng tôi sẽ tham gia cùng với các sở ban ngành để tham mưu cho lãnh đạo thành phố xây dựng một cái chính sách, một cái kế hoạch để có thể cùng với các cái doanh nghiệp và tham gia sâu rộng vào trong các hiệp định thương mại thế hệ mới. Trong đó, cái việc phát triển nguồn nhân lực chất lượng cao cũng như là có các cái chính sách phát triển doanh nghiệp bền vững hơn là những cái vấn đề mà chúng tôi sẽ trọng tâm trong thời gian tới. The University of Science and Technology Da Nang has been a major source of talent for Japanese companies looking to hire. There are about 15,000 students enrolled here. 
the university works closely with industry players, designing curriculums that prepare students for the workforce. À, thì đối với chương trình các cái, các hợp tác với các cái với Nhật Bản thì trường đại học Bách Khoa à, từ những là đã có cái chương trình công nghệ thông tin tiếng Nhật. Đây là cái chương trình đào tạo mà dùng để cung cấp nguồn nhân lực ngành công nghệ thông tin cho Nhật Bản. À, ngoài ra thì nhà trường cũng có rất nhiều cái chương trình à, có liên quan đến cái đối tác Nhật Bản và được các doanh nghiệp cũng như các cái đại trường đại học ở Nhật Bản hỗ trợ. Theo em thì quan trọng nhất vẫn phải là ngoại ngữ và trong thời buổi bây giờ là thời buổi hòa nhập và thì sinh viên thì cần phải có cho mình một vốn ngoại ngữ tốt để có thể làm việc trao đổi hoặc là học tập ở các môi trường đa quốc gia hoặc là các doanh nghiệp nước ngoài ở Việt Nam thì các doanh nghiệp Nhật Bản thì luôn luôn được chào đón và luôn gọi là được rất là coi trọng ở Việt Nam bởi vì có cái môi trường làm việc chuyên nghiệp họ có cái môi trường làm việc tốt ưu đãi cao và có cái sự thăng tiến cũng cao Japan's investments in Da Nang go beyond factories. They also play an important role in developing critical infrastructure. Tian Sa Terminal is the gateway to the South China Sea and Japan's east-west economic corridor. The Japan International Corporation Agency funded the terminal's recent upgrading. This is part of a master plan to enhance the flow of goods in and out of the city. Danan plans to develop a series of key infrastructure projects, including Nenchu port, uh, railway station relocation, smart traffic system, mass rapid uh, transit that aim to turn the central city into an international standard logistics center in the east-west economic corridor by 2030. Container throughput volumes are already growing. In 2010, the terminal handled just under 90,000 containers a year. Ten years later, volumes have multiplied more than six times to half a million containers yearly. Hiện, hiện nay thì cảng Đà Nẵng là có đến 7 cái bến, 7 khu bến và với chiều dài của các bến là 1.700m à, và cái tổng diện tích của cái toàn bộ của kho và bãi của cảng cũng như các đơn vị thành viên trong cảng thì lên đến khoảng 35 hecta và cái là cỡ tàu mà tàu tổng hợp mà có thể là lớn nhất có thể đến làm hàng cảng là đối với tàu 70.000 tấn là giảm tải và tàu container có thể lên đến là 4.000 tiêu và cái sản lượng hàng hóa trong năm 2022 thì chúng tôi dự kiến nó nằm khoảng trong khoảng 13 triệu tấn và nằm gần gần sắp xỉ khoảng 700.000 tiêu trong năm nay. As part of the upgrade, the harbor was dredged to allow larger vessels to dock. A new breakwater was also constructed, along with other improvements to speed up the turnaround time of loading and unloading vessels. Since we are the development agency for Japan, we do have to think about Japan, but we first think about how our activity benefit to the country. Our president always says every project first think about the people living in the country and all the nationals living there and then to the to how it benefit to Japan Just outside of Danang city stands a village that's the center of one of the country's oldest trades. This is Da Nang's stone carving village, home to a flourishing 400-year-old craft industry. Giant marble blocks are painstakingly cut down to size, chiseled and polished into works of art. Chen Wen Swat is the owner of this gallery. On sale are Greek goddesses, Roman legionaries and religious statues. But his favorite collection is inspired by Vietnam's Cham people, an ancient maritime kingdom. 
and it so happens to be the favorite of some of his overseas buyers. Thì lúc năm 94 chín làm á là người uh, Đức người ta qua nhiều mà người Đức là, là họ rất thích voi. Ừ, ấy là phần á rất thích voi cho nên là rồi là lòm vua đứng vua ngồi đống lụa vua nhưng mà mon một số thì mình làm theo cái phong cách bây giờ một số mình làm theo phong cách phong cách châu Âu à, châu uh, của người trăm ba à, là vị thần đấy là phần của người người Đức là nó cũng phỏa vào một cái, cái để cho hầu những người đó người làm đó người ta tọt ra những bức tượng như vậy. The logistics of the trade were once a major challenge. Marble is sourced from a quarry and trucked along the Haivan Pass, a 21-kilometer journey across mountains. Có nhiều khi đó mà chuyển từ Nghệ An về đây tới bảy tám ngày, với đấy Đà Nẵng tới vô xưởng mình là bảy tám ngày với đấy, không có hầm. Khi, khi, khi mình chuyển lúc đó về đến Đà Hải Bằng, khi lên Đà Hải Bằng á thì phải hai người đứng phía sau này mình mới cầm một cái cái cai để xe nhích lên vì cái 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 lúc đó là xe nó còn yếu kém lắm mình nhích lên từng từng bước 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 lên tới đó có nhiều khi là cả đây em xúc cả đây đã từ trên đèo hải vân mà xuống lại được đến cái 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 đèo bên đây bên của đà nẵng là rất khó khăn nhưng mà for chen vân suat the roads are critical for him to ensure the steady supply of raw materials to carve statues Investments in Japan's Foyt plan have also enhanced the last mile, the road connections between industrial areas and the ports. This means that exporting statues to Germany takes considerably less time than it did. According to the Vietnam Industry Research and Consultancy, logistics in Vietnam can cost the equivalent of 20% of the gross domestic product, double the global average. In 2021, the government announced that it would scale up the current 1,290 kilometers of national highway to 5,000 kilometers by 2030. It will also upgrade existing roads and increase connections to major ports, airports, and railway stations. As much as 70% of national highway projects in Vietnam are built and funded by JICA Investments. And here is one of them. This is the Hai Vân Tunnel. At just over six kilometers, it's the longest road tunnel in Southeast Asia. Thì cũng có thể nói rằng là đây là cái công trình đầu tiên mà Việt Nam cùng với nước bạn là Nhật Bản phối hợp triển khai một cách rất là hiệu quả. Và từ đó thì chúng ta phát triển các cái đường hầm tiếp theo. The first tunnel was completed in June 2005, followed by the second in 2021. Khi chúng ta chưa có hầm Hải Vân, thì cái việc giao thông giữa thành phố Đà Nẵng và Thừa Thiên Huế phải qua một con đèo Hải Vân là con đèo mà nổi tiếng nhất thế giới, nhất Việt Nam về cái 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 độ nguy hiểm và quanh co. Có rất nhiều cái vụ tai nạn thương tâm xảy ra trên đường đèo. Thế thì từ khi có hầm Hải Vân thì có phải nói rằng cái việc chúng ta di chuyển uh, từ 20 km đường đèo nguy hiểm đó chỉ còn lại uh, hơn 6 km và đặc biệt nhất là giải quyết được bài toán tìm ẩn cái tai nạn khi lưu thông qua đường đèo và thì uh, các yếu tố đó làm sẽ thúc đẩy cái sự phát triển kinh tế hành lang đông tây ở khu vực uh, as Vietnam continues to develop, energy security becomes ever more pressing. The country's breakneck economic growth is putting pressure on its energy sources, as coal-fired power plants continue to dominate the national grid. To hit global emission reduction targets, Vietnam will have to concurrently ramp up the renewables sector. Quang Chi is a province in the central highlands of Vietnam. These hills were battlegrounds during the Vietnam War. They're now home to wind farms, a growing number of them. 
the Quanchi Wind Power Plant project is the JICA's first project finance for wind power generation project in Vietnam. It is expected to serve as a model case for private sector wind power generation projects in the renewable energy sector in Vietnam, including those by Japanese and local companies. Hydroelectricity is the main source of renewable energy in Vietnam, accounting for about 6% of the total supply, while other renewable energy sources like wind and solar account for less than 1%. As of 2021, Vietnam generates 16.5 gigawatts of solar power and 11.8 gigawatts of wind power. Plans are already underway to harvest more energy from the wind. There are currently 19 wind projects in Quang Chi province, with a total capacity of over 671 megawatts. Another 12 projects are under construction. Thì dự kiến là cái phát triển về điện năng của Việt Nam hiện nay thì uh, trung bình là khoảng 10% một năm. Thế chính vì thế mà trong tầm nhìn từ nay đến 2030 thì là uh, Việt Nam sẽ phát triển thêm uh, uh, mỗi năm uh, cỡ khoảng 7 đến 8 gigawatt điện điện. Ở trong đó thì uh, với cái mục tiêu mà uh, phát thải dọc bằng không vào năm 2050 thì uh, Việt Nam sẽ ưu tiên phát triển các cái uh, năng lượng tái tạo như là điện gió, uh, điện mặt trời, điện uh, sinh khối. Thì trong quá trình xây dựng dự án cũng như là vận hành dự án thì các cái đoàn kỹ sư của của phía Nhật Bản thì cũng sang vào các cái giai đoạn mà xây dựng cũng như là vận hành để kiểm tra tiến độ thi công rồi là cũng là trao đổi với với các cái kỹ sư Việt Nam của chúng tôi về cái vận hành về cái xây dựng và vận hành dự án và các anh cũng rất là trong quá trình làm việc rất là là uh, nghiêm túc cũng rất là uh, chia sẻ các cái kiến thức các cái công nghệ các cái uh, uh, các cái kinh nghiệm về về năng lượng tái tạo của của Nhật Bản uh, đối với cái dự án. Vâng. The strong relationship developed between Japan and Vietnam has also meant the two countries have collaborated on more sensitive projects. The two countries have a history of security and defense deals. In 2014, they established an extensive strategic partnership. As part of the deal, Japan provided Vietnam with six used vessels to aid the country's maritime security. Over time, the partnership has strengthened. In 2020, JICA signed a deal to finance the construction of six Coast Guard patrol boats worth 347 million US dollars. And now we are working for the prov uh, providing the, uh, the Vietnam Coast Guard for the uh, procure vessels, supporting and improvement in maritime rescue operations and maritime law enforcement. Uh, this aim is to enhance freedom of navigation. The project will contribute to the achievement of SDG's goals 14 and 16 and the realization of a free and open Indo-Pacific, which Vietnam government also aims to have. The strengthened defense relationship between Japan and Vietnam shows that both countries have aligned their strategic and security interests. Trước hết thì tôi nói là cái việc chúng ta có cái chiến lược phát triển kinh tế biển bảo vệ cái kể cả chủ quyền về của chúng ta ở trên biển đó là những cái lợi ích chính đáng của chúng ta. Và để như vậy thì chúng ta có những quyền lợi chính đáng để phát triển quan hệ với tất cả các đối tác để có củng cố những tiềm lực của chúng ta theo như hướng đó. Và chúng ta không hề có ý định là phát triển những cái vũ khí hoặc là những cái công cụ đó để chống lại bất kể ai, ngoại trừ cái việc bảo vệ lợi ích của chúng ta. Thì tôi nghĩ rằng là nếu ai đó có phần nào đó lo ngại thì có thể đó cũng là một chuyện thừa thôi bởi vì chúng ta không có ý định. China is Vietnam's most important economic partner. 
But the two countries have competing maritime interests in the South China Sea. And this point of contention has been known to flare up from time to time. Là ASEAN không muốn đứng về một phía bên nào ở các nước lớn trong cái quá trình mà cạnh tranh giữa các nước. Và nói về đến những cái chiến lược thì như tôi cũng đã đề cập là cái đối tác Ấn Độ Dương Thái Bình Dương mà đã xác định trên hai cái cạnh chính thì chính là việc đánh bắt cá trái phép và cái việc mà trao đổi thông tin đối với những cái vấn đề giải quyết thảm họa thiên nhiên hay là những cái vấn đề nhân đạo như cứu hộ cứu nạn. Thì trên cái khía cạnh đó thì về mặt những cái khía cạnh này thì có lẽ là Việt Nam cũng đã xác định cái việc mà đánh bắt cá trái phép thì cũng cần phải tuân thủ những cái luật pháp quốc tế và Việt Nam cũng mong muốn tất cả các nước ở trong khu vực thì tuân theo những cái công ước của Liên Hợp Quốc liên quan đến cái vấn đề về đánh bắt cá ở tại khu vực Nội Dương Thái Bình Dương. I think what Japan offers more broadly is a um, an ability to have a third way. So these Japan um, is also um, caught in the you know, the competition between great powers, right? The rivalry between China and the United States. But Japan shares an interest with Southeast Asian countries to ensure uh, that regardless of what happens between Washington and Beijing, that their own economies and their own uh, societies are insulated from the, these competing um, countries as, as much as possible. So the Japanese approach to ensure that voices are heard, that there is a focus on investing in society is going to resonate a lot more with Southeast Asian countries moving forward. On the other side of the South China Sea, Japan's investments are not only impacting economies, but also the lives of people living in a typhoon-prone country. The Philippines is hit by an average of 20 typhoons every year. They cause major flooding, destroying property and uprooting lives. The growth of informal settlements and lack of adequate infrastructure add to the problem. Virginia Peralta's barangay, or district, is in Mandaluyong, the center of Metro Manila. She remembers the city's worst flood in 2009, when Typhoon Ketsana struck. This Kaya ginagawa ko, inaabang ako bumaba yung tubig, tsaka ako nililimas. The Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, is working with the Department of Public Works and Highways to alleviate the crippling floods. Work is currently underway on the Pasig Marikina River. A team led by Japanese engineers are widening and reinforcing the river's banks. We just increasing of the, the flood capacity of the river channels by the dredgings and the construction of the flood walls, the heightened of the, uh, the dike, diking systems. The flood control gate is regulate of the, the flood flow ratio to downstreams and other other flow, other river channels. The purpose of the construct of the flood gate and sluice gate is to prevent of the, the, the backwater the, from the inland areas. The project won't completely solve Manila's flooding woes. In extreme weather events, like a Category 4 typhoon, the river is still expected to overflow. But the mitigation system would reduce the extent of damage to communities living near the river. Residents would have to learn how to adapt whenever a flood occurs. People should know which area is has risk 
of the, inund the deep inundation areas. That's why the, the, the provision of the flood risk map or flood hazard maps is essential to save the life, even though after the phase four project. JICA has arranged a workshop for residents. They have created a topographical map and ask residents to mark areas where they have experienced flooding. The information collected helps residents better understand the geography of their settlement. It also allows JICA to acquire historical knowledge of flood-prone areas from the residents themselves. These maps will be crucial in highlighting low-lying risk areas and to plot evacuation routes. Uh, siyempre, ano eh, hindi pa, hindi pa tayo prepared nun eh. So wala pang ganito nun eh. So talagang bulaga. Nagising ka na lang, lumulugod na ka na sa tubig eh. Lubog na yung bahay. Kapag ka, siyempre, alam mo na kung nasaan yung alin yung high risk, alin yung medium risk, nasaan yung evacuation center. So halimbawa, yung evacuation center nandun sa binabaha, hindi na namin gagamitin yung nasa evacuation center. Hahanap kami ng iba. Actually, talagang marami magbe-benefit dito sa ano sa ganitong klaseng workshop, no? Dahil uh, ito ay isa sa talag uh, malaki, dalawang malaking barangay na kinasasakupan ng bayan ng Kainta. At sa mga residente nito ay talagang marami ring magbe-benepisyo dahil nga doon sa tinatawag natin na uh, yung mga flood prone areas. Japan is also investing in energy, agriculture, and health projects in the Philippines. And it has also given out official development assistance, or ODA, to the Philippines. The country has been among the largest recipients of Japan's ODA. There are many studies that confirm uh, its positive effect on economic growth. Uh, Japan is the largest uh, ODA provider you know, to the country uh, since the 1970s and is also one of the biggest uh, investor no, in the country. So in our case, for example, the infrastructural development no, that Japan um, is funding is actually aligned with the medium-term Philippine development plan. So in a way, that contributes also no, to our economic growth and uh, development. Another ASEAN country where Japanese investment is really making a difference is Myanmar. Since the military coup, there has been an exodus of international investments from many countries, but not from the Japanese, who have saved the course. The latest developments in Myanmar has actually not deflected Japan from continuing to invest and being engaged um, with um, the, the current uh, government. Tokyo's argument is that rapid withdrawal or complete withdrawal from Myanmar would, would actually do more harm uh, than, than good. Well, Japan worries about the human rights issues in Myanmar. They're worried about the, what's happened in terms of the Jintap. But they also have long-term interests in the country in terms of um, acquiring resources from the region, uh, whether that's rare earth material or other materials, in building infrastructure to help it development, but also seeing it as an important geopolitical piece of the ASEAN pu puzzle. And, and because of its size, because of its resources, um, it really can't neglect Myanmar. Um, and even though we've had political disruption there because of almost a civil war, that Japan still feels the need to be part of that and to try and wait out uh, the political turmoil in that country so that they can go back and invest and try to help with building stability in Myanmar. But importantly also, um, you know, ensure that China doesn't fill the vacuum that has been left by the exodus of Western countries. Whether it's in Indonesia, Vietnam, or the Philippines, Japan's FOIP plan has brought much needed infrastructure and economic growth. In a region where governments are concerned about the US-China rivalry, the free and open Indo-Pacific plan could act as a counterbalance. 
I believe that you know countries in the region would benefit from a constructive competition between China, the United States, and Japan. If this compels them to provide more uh, development assistance, more infrastructure finance, public goods to address the uh, pandemic. And therefore, we should encourage constructive uh, competition. But there's one area where Japan does something that I believe China and the United States are not quite ready to do. And that is to really uh, enforce, shore up rules-based trade. We're seeing China talk about globalization while it's actually pursuing self-sufficiency and it's not opening much the crowning heights of its economy. And we're seeing the United States take a step back from trade leadership at the same time that Japan is pushing forward with important trade initiatives like the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I think that when you put together the package of you know, added sources of financing in a more predictable way and in a way that protects and tries to encourage the supply chain that has been an engine of growth for the region, I think that's where Japan can make a difference. As economic partnerships continue to grow and create bonds between countries, they influence the geopolitical landscape. Đặc biệt hiện nay khi chúng ta đẩy mạnh hợp tác với rất nhiều những đối tác thì những cái gì mà có lợi cho sự phát triển của Việt Nam, có lợi cho việc đảm bảo cái hòa bình ổn định và phát triển ở khu vực thì chúng ta sẽ tham gia. The existing multilateral framework actually allows Japan to cooperate with China together with countries in the region, be that Southeast Asia or East Asia. And the most important thing for that is Indonesia playing the leadership role in trying to push an ASEAN-based centrality for all this regional framework. So that's really the importance of having multilateral framework um, to provide space for uh, broader cooperations that includes both China, uh, uh, Japan, as well as the United States eventually. Japan is making a bet. It's investing in ASEAN, not only for its own economic future, but also for ASEAN to become a strong and independent bloc. Its investments already foster greater connectivity across borders. The hope is that they would also bring stability in an era of uncertainty.